PNOW, injecting everyday brands into consumer culture, featuring Chief Brand Officer at Health Beauty, Lori Lam, who has nearly 20 years of experience building global beauty brands, including L'Oreal USA, and Chris Sheesbro, who is the Global Chief Digital Officer at Weller Company, where he runs the company's efforts to accelerate digital growth drivers and turn it into a data powerhouse. They're joined by moderator Carly Lieberman, Vice President of Customer Success at Suzy. I was really counting on the two of you to do the promised dance on stage. What is maybe, this? Maybe There's still time. off stage. Yeah, the, maybe we off. have to we shimmy have off stage yeah. or something. We'll do that. Lori, Chris, it is so good to have you here. Um, so as someone who spends a lot of time thinking about the beauty world, to be on stage alongside the two of you is pretty incredible. Two people who have built insane brands that have had wild success in a very, very competitive space. So thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you for having us. My pleasure. So um, to contextualize the incredible performance that we've seen from your brands, I'd love to turn back time for a second. Mm -hmm. Talk to us about your brand story uh, and what parts of your brand story are as relevant today as they were on day one. Oh boy. Lori, let's start with you and Elf. Yeah. All right, well, the origin story of ELF, and to understand the origin story of ELF, you have to understand what true disruption means, and I'll tell you why. So the origin story is rooted in disruption, and the reason for that is because our brand actually started with a father-son duo that actually sought out a white space. That white space was selling premium quality cosmetics over the internet for a dollar in 2004. Did you get all that? I would say that it's white space now even, right? But when they did that, just if you're doing the math already, to, that was actually three years before the iPhone existed. So the thought of buying anything for a dollar right now would give me the heebie-jeebies, so never mind premium quality cosmetics. So right there in that story, in that origin story, you have exactly why ELF was rooted in disruption. The DNA is disruptive. And on top of that, you actually unlocked the mission of ELF which is to, the mission is actually to make the best of beauty accessible to every eye, lip, and face, which stands for ELF, Elf Beauty. The reason why this is the disruptive origin story is it tells you so much about how it's rooted in making sure that value is passed on to the consumer in our products with great quality. Amazing. We're gonna dig into some of the disruptive examples in just a sec, but um, Chris, would love to hear from you about Wella. Yeah, from a Wella perspective, I think there's a couple things that are important to start with. One is the, the business is 144 years old. Um, Wella Professionals was launched in Germany 144 years ago and really created the, the hair color, uh, oxidative hair color industry. Uh, L'Oreal did something a little bit later, but you know, the, the, the real first start of figuring out how to inject a dye into the hair follicle and make it last, that was a, a, Wella, a Wella creation 144 years ago. Um, the second thing is that we're a business of uh, founder-created companies, uh, founder-created businesses. So Wella Professionals was, was owned by a family. Nioxin Professional was started by a doctor. Um, OPI was started by Susie Fish. GHD was started by two hairdressers in the UK. So everything really starts with a, a first intimate human connection. Mm. Uh, and that leads into the third thing, which I think is the, the, the people. Um, we work in a business in beauty that is professionally credentialed, is the way I describe it. Uh, it starts in a salon. That can be a nail salon, that can be a hair salon, but it starts with that connection between mm -hmm. the nail technician or the hairdresser and their customer and their consumer. Um, and it's a little bit old now, but I like the data point coming out of the first round of lockdowns in, uh, in COVID. We did some consumer research to see what would consumers do after they were allowed to go back outside. Um, and we did the research in basically top 10 markets, give or take. And the number one thing across every single country that consumers said they wanted to do when they were able to go back outside was go to the hairdresser. Mm -hmm. They didn't want to go see family, they didn't want to go see friends, they didn't want to go do, go to the amusement park or whatever, they wanted to go back to the hairdresser. Um, so yeah. that, that connection that, uh, that is created in beauty and that I think is even accelerated in professional beauty mm -hmm. is what is at the heart of our business. Yeah. And I think that's why we're successful. 
Um, I, I liken professional beauty business to almost a software as a service style business mm -hmm. because the switching costs are really hard. Mm -hmm. You want to go to the same hairdresser, you use the same nail technicians. Mm -hmm. um, so it's a very, very sticky category and I think that combination of, of heritage, that combination of community and keeping the people at the center is really what makes our brands successful. Can I build to that yeah. for a second? I worked in, for 20 years in hairdressing and one thing I will say is that your hairdresser is almost like your therapist. Yeah. And 100%. on top of that, it's actually one of the only professions today where it's legally okay to touch someone else. Mm. <laughs> so, I haven't I thought about it like that. So, I like that. So you have the hairdressing and the human connection, and ELF is really about the disruption that still carries through today. Mm -hmm. So it's very interesting to hear how these origin stories are still at the root of what our brand is doing today. Absolutely. Absolutely. Beauty is an incredibly psychological and emotional category. Um, you spoke about the brand sort of stories. Let's talk about the incredible performance that each of your brands has, has had in the market. Elf Beauty is the number one cosmetics brand for all teens. And for the past 21 consecutive quarters, 22, 22 consecutive <laughs> quarters has had 20% plus growth a remarkable feat in this incredibly competitive category. And Chris, Wella is growing more than 2X as fast as, as the category and has really carved out a niche within the B2B to C space. So talk to us about what is that one thing, if you had to distill it down, that you believe has most contributed to the success that your two brands have had? Lori, let's start with you. Is it just one? One, two, three, how the list goes on, I'm I'll sure. do a 1.5, <laughs> I'll do a 1.5. So the first thing I would say is, Elf is a brand that is, I would say, defies almost all odds. It is a different kind of company. We are a brand that actually, the reason why we're winning brand is because we are actually a brand that product is transcended. We are a company that transcends product, that I would argue transcends brand. I would argue we're a different kind of company and argue in many ways, just coming off of Sophia being up here, is that we are an entertainment company because we are in the business of listening to our consumer. You heard Kofi say that before, right? The focus is on the consumer. Absolutely for ELF is that ever more true because the community is at the heart of telling us what the needs, the desires, the wants, the shifts in the business actually cue up to that. So much that our community feeds back to us. ELF, it's almost like you're in my head. Get out of my head, stop <laughs> listening. It's like you're listening to me. And to that, I have to say, you're right. We are listening. Sophia mentioned earlier, our CMO listening to social comments. We read every single email that comes in from our community. Every single email about the order not arriving on time to the pencil got bent up in the box. We read that because that actually fuels our continuous improvement. The point five I would add to this, and I think <laughs> this is where sometimes it gets underrated, is our board of directors. And I'll get to in a second, bear with me. Our board of directors is actually over 70% female and over 40% diverse. Do you know how many companies out there have that composition on their board of directors, publicly traded? Only one, and that one is ELF. And so why I say that's a factor is because when your board of directors is reflective of the community that you serve, they make better decisions to serve that community. So that's why it's a 1.5. The one would be absolutely, it's ELF is a brand that transcends product to be something that's more of an ideology. And the second part of it is our board of directors that sit there making the right decisions to serve our community. Absolutely, putting consumer and first, uh, consumer first and your community, heart and center, you know, front and center of everything that you do as a brand. Yeah. Um, Chris, how about you? What is, what is the 1.5 thing that has <laughs> contributed to, to well as performance success? I can, I can follow the rules. Um, <laughs> <laughs> now, I, I think for us, it's, it's one word, which is focus. Uh, we have very clearly aligned strategic priorities, and that drives the focus of our teams around the world. Um, we, we have very clear focus on a category. That category is professionally credentialed beauty. Mm -hmm. um, and we have very clear focus in the fact that we uh, recently became a standalone private company. Uh, we had historically over the past 15 to 17 years been owned by a number of larger conglomerates. And at the end of 2020, um, we became a standalone private company, privately held. Um, so take a step back away from that quarterly cycle that the public companies have to, have to go through. We can really focus on what is that rolling three-year strategy um, and that focus that we have on making sure that we're building the professional industry. This is something that's really important for us because we are 
I say it somewhat truthfully, but I believe it's really true. We are really one of the last large multi-billion multinational companies that is really focusing on supporting the professional hairdressing and professional nail industry. Because if the hairdresser's business grows, our business grows. Mm -hmm. And that's something that we're, we're really, really focused on. So I, I've said focus probably 30 times, but <laughs> um, focus is really the, the thing that I think is driving our success right yeah. now. Yeah, and you focused on giving one answer. So. Yes. <laughs> Amazing. So I think a common thread in what both of you talked about is community, right? Putting your five million consumers who are part of your your panel front and center of everything that you're doing as a brand and, you know, professionals being core to your strategy as a brand. Talk to us about the ways that you're, as brands, tapping into that community and tapping into culture in a way that is driving disruption, in a way that is driving brand relevance. Mm -hmm. Lori, let's start with you. Yeah, the answer is actually rooted in that story about the origin, but it's also rooted in the fact that we're listening to our community. We, one of the things that we pride ourselves on doing is having our ear to the ground on what our community is saying. And there's been probably a reflection of you know, campaigns and I would say launches that actually have been built off of our community, much like we just launched something in our elf skin range, which is called Bronzing Drops. And it's to give you that beautiful summer glow when you actually didn't go to the Melfi Coast. <laughs> and so you, you just blend it in with your moisturizer and bam, you've got it, you've got that glow. And that product was not something that we had originally in our innovation pipeline. It was actually something that our community asked us if we would actually launch that for them. They were, you know, they, and the, there is, there are comparative, there are competitive products out there that do that just fine. But they asked Elf to deliver it to them because they know that we would deliver it without 2,500 harmful ingredients. They know that we would deliver it to them and ensure that it's double cruelty certified. They know that we would also deliver that with the board of directors that's sitting at the table. Mm -hmm. And walk us through that story. Like, just how fast are you actioning on that type of insight from, from your community? Walk us through what that process looks so, like. I'll give you one memorative clip, seconds, seconds. <laughs> and it's the number of seconds that it took our CEO to walk from the TikTok live that he was doing, Sophia, shout out to you, um, to the moment that he walked down to the hallway where our innovation team was sitting and said, we would like you to fast track bronzing drops. So the number of seconds. Mm -hmm. Talking about disruption, right? Disruption. With, with disruption, you have to be able to Move recognize fast. that you have yeah. to move fast. Mm -hmm. And, you know, sometimes it's taking insights and, you know, you, you're, you take them and you say, okay, there's only so much that I have right now and that information and the rest of it, you just got to be bold enough to do that. Mm -hmm. And Chris, how are you tapping into your community? Your professionals are at the core of what you're doing and that's really driving your, your strategy yeah. as a brand. How are you engaging with that community to make sure, sure that that's fueling your success as a brand? So we use um, what we call very simply a dual target approach. Um, our, our flywheel as a company and our growth mechanism as a company is really founded on having conversations with our professional community, but then also leveraging the connections that that professional community has with consumers as well. So we work with around 2 million hairdressers uh, and nail technicians worldwide, and that community actually expands to about 250 million consumers uh, worldwide that we're able to have some type of interaction with on a, on a regular basis. And we look at that very closely because the spikes in things like earned media value show us whether or not the relevancy of our conversation is actually, is actually growing. Right now we're neck and neck with uh, our largest competitor in the US on number one in, in earned media value. Uh, but that's a metric that we look at very, very closely. Mm -hmm. uh, but it really starts with that credential that comes from the professional. If the product is able to be used on 15 different consumers in one day by a hairdresser who's working 12 hours a day, it's going to do a pretty good job for the one time a day that you use it, or maybe three times a week that you use it at home, if it's a shampoo or a conditioner, what have you. So that, that torture test of the salon is really a proof point. Uh, and then we try and expand that message as much as possible to consumers uh, in the places where they're consuming that content. And how do you think that sort of process is fundamentally different from the way other beauty brands are driving success with their professional audiences, for example? I think it's the investment in the professional channel. I think it's the investment, continued investment in education, mm -hmm. uh, training our professionals on the right services so that they're able to then theoretically charge more money for that service so they can be more profitable um, as a business. 
uh, investing in their business skills mm -hmm. so that their small businesses can be successful. Hairdressers are primarily small businesses. They're primarily uh, SMBs, uh, which are the lifeblood of essentially every economy around the world. Uh, but they don't tend to have gone to business school. They went to beauty school. Mm -hmm. So they're not necessarily taught the fundamentals about how to manage your books, how to manage your taxes, how to manage payroll, how to manage scheduling. Mm -hmm. That's all things that they tend to learn on the job. So our continued investment in, in their professional development, even though it might not be how to use the hair color product, but we teach them how to manage social media, we can provide websites for them, provide booking platforms for them. All of those things are slightly ancillary to our business, but they're actually not because it's about making sure that that business is viable. Uh, and that's something that I believe is differentiated to the Wella company, um, that we're really focused on that for the, the professionals all around the world. Mm -hmm. Really helping to build demand exactly. uh, for those businesses and in a category that maybe isn't as digitally savvy, mm -hmm. um, really inserting some of that to help drive more success for those exactly. professionals as well. Um, so, Lori, I know you mentioned talking about um, a specific example of how ELF has disrupted. One yeah. example, how you've tapped into culture and community was the bronzing drops that you talked about. What is another example of a way that you've managed to disrupt mm -hmm. um, by tapping into your into culture, tapping into community in a way that has really fueled ELF success? Yeah, absolutely. For us, it's, it's everything does start with the community, but it also starts with insights. And oftentimes those, those insights are community social led insights that drive us to actually take action. And we do have a strong bias for action in that sense of a 20 year old brand who really thinks like an indie brand. <laughs> so one of the examples is, and I'm gonna build this because it was a trifecta of insights that actually drove us to do something. The first insight was that ELF has broad, multi-generational appeal. Everyone from grandma, to the young alpha is using elf in some way, shape, or form. Second one, which is that there's something that our social community actually led us to that kind of got us on a, on a little uh, hunting trail, is they told us about this term called elf pinching. Pinching, yep. Okay, an elf pinching. I was like, what is an elf pincher? An elf pincher is someone in your family who borrows a product <laughs> and has no intention to return it. No intention. I, I can attest to this because my daughter does this every single day of my lip oil. The third one, and you guys are gonna think I'm wild here, but the third insight that drove us was we actually had an insight that told us half of Americans consume true crime content. You sickos out there. So true crime content, but two thirds of those are actually women. So when you take those three together, you're like, well, what are they gonna do? They put in the cement mixer, what comes out of it? What comes out of it is we actually took those insights and we decided to feed back to the community what they were telling us about the elf pinchers, right? Having to buy products. People were telling us they were storing it into the freezer so their daughter wouldn't find it. Wow. Okay, so that's extreme. It's very Getting extreme. very clever. These very parents. clever. So what we did was we created a 15 minute documentary detailing around a family, around product that just went pinched. It got pinched. And the whole thing was around a whodunit series. So it's very, very captivating. I invite you to go watch it on Freebie. <laughs> and it, it was around this. And we had no business doing a 15 minute movie that, by the way, went into AMC theaters nationwide. So no, Elf was not a beauty company in that sense. We became our entertainment arm, which is called Elf Made, by producing a movie. But again, that was in the spirit of our community, putting something out there that they had mm -hmm. fed us into an entertaining medium and a platform of doing a movie for them. And what's the sniff test for the brand? Like, there are infinite places that you can go and expand as a brand. How do you sort of decide what insights you're going to capitalize on from your, from your consumers in a way that is going to drive that brand disruption? I would say it's an art and science, but I also would say it's where we feel our community is telling us and, and there's multiple signs that take us there. Those trifecta of insights would not have landed in a 15 minute documentary if we had not built a constellation around it. So I think that's part of the world around Suzy, which I love too, is building that constellation for us so we become smarter and we become sharper at hitting something with cultural relevance at speed that our community sees themselves in. Mm -hmm. And what's an example for Wella of how you've tapped into your community in order to propel disruption um, and relevance for your brand? Yeah, I think a great example would be um, on our GHD brand uh, last year. Um, you know, one of the things, uh, GHD, for those who don't know, it's a, it's a hot styling brand, best in the world. 
Um, really fantastic product. Launched in uh, in the UK about 20 years ago. Did you use it today? Uh, I, I unfortunately, <laughs> my hair's not long enough. Uh, but I did blow dry this morning. Oh, there you go. Uh, <laughs> but um, you know, last year, uh, well, even before last year, one of the key insights in uh, with hot styling is that it's always plugged in. Mm -hmm. um, and it's a little bit challenging when you've got to figure out if you're traveling between the US and Europe or let alone mm -hmm. somewhere else. Um, and last year we, we launched a product on GHD that was called cordless, unplugged. Um, and it was one of the first products in the, in the market at that point in time that didn't require a, a plug. That's cool. um, and we used a very uh, simple approach in terms of tapping into the influencers that GHG has been working with for a very, very long time. So big, big scale ones like Cara Dauer in Germany, Chiara Ferragni, um, uh, Victoria Beckham, a number, a number of others. And we created a moment around uh, the launch also of a exhibition in Paris at the Museum of uh, Arts and Designs. Um, where they were, they had a, um, a six-month-long exhibition on the history of hair. Mm. Really, really interesting exhibition. Unfortunately, it closed in September last year, but it's all online. Um, and we, as a company, were the official sponsor of, uh, of, of said exhibition. And we leveraged that moment to bring all of those influencers into the Museum of Arts and Design, which is actually in the Louvre. So even though it's a, a different museum, it's in the Louvre. So incredible, incredible setting, incredible product placement with these people who have been working with GHD for years. Uh, and I think that's an important point. It wasn't a, let's bring in some people who are big uh, because they're exciting. It's no, these are people who have been working with GHD over, over years and have a relationship with the brand, and therefore their audience has a relationship with mm -hmm. the brand. Um, and Unplugged was an, a completely uh, resounding success. Mm -hmm. uh, and a lot of that was due to the fact that we launched it in such a specific, concise manner, leveraging amazing moments from a culture perspective, amazing moments from an influencer perspective. And at the heart of it, you have to have a great product. Mm -hmm. So. The disco ball even started yeah, exactly. spinning got for really you. Excited. It agrees with yeah. your success. Um, and I think what's really interesting, I think both of you spoke about specific examples of how you're tapping into your community, tapping into culture, driving disruption. How do you do that in a way that is consistent, right? Like it's one thing to come up with a buzzy campaign or a buzzy new product that's successful once. How do you do that on repeat in a way that continues to fuel your success? Chris, maybe expand upon your answer with that. Sure, I mean, that's the hardest thing. Yeah. Uh, especially for multi-brand, multinational mm -hmm. organizations. Um, and to me, the, the, the real key to it is making sure that you have consistency in organization design. Uh, it's not the sexiest thing in the world, but having consistency <laughs> in organization design so you know where that, that clear handoff is from the global brand stands for this. But for a business like ours, the global brand team can't do everything for every market. It's just simply not possible. Mm -hmm. So making sure that that handoff point from the global brand team to the local brand team is clear. Mm -hmm. What are the rules of what the local teams can do versus what the, uh, the, the global brand stands for is absolutely critical. So I would say organizational design, clarity of brand guidelines and brand book. Again, not the sexiest thing in the world, but we're talking about operationalization, yep. which you need to have those kinds of um, rules and guideposts yeah. in place in order to make sure that the brand looks consistent um, around the world, uh, but also is relevant locally to specific trends. Yep. And for us, that's transparently still a journey. Um, we, we are, we're still working through that. We've only been, uh, like I said, this standalone focused company will be four years on December 1st. Mm -hmm. um, so it's still very much uh, a journey for us, but I would say consistency in organizational design and very clear workflow handoffs on, on who's responsible for what. Yeah, Lori, I imagine that must be a strength of ELF as well in that you know, you see something on TikTok, your CEO leaves the room, you go invent that thing, right, as it relates to, to bronzing drops. So what would you add in terms of how ELF, um, the way that you're all structured from a team and organizational design perspective continues to, to see success as a, as a brand? I would add this one piece just in terms of consistency. You know, mm -hmm. it might feel like consistency and disruption are the two ends, two opposite ends, mm -hmm. but I believe that the two can be true because our disruptive and our bold and our renegade spirit, that will never change. We are consistent in that voice. Our community is expecting us to deliver those things. So the consistency in being bold and disruptive, checkpoint. 
The other part of it that I would say is really important, why the two can be true, is because you need to be consistent in what you're delivering. Mm -hmm. And delivering above all that is a really great product. And we heard that mentioned this today, this morning already, and you, with this GNG, GHG unplug that you're gonna give me one. <laughs> <laughs> these are things, these are factors that I think you can't deny as a brand, because you've gotta have that solid footing to stand on. Mm -hmm. We all need freebies coming out of yeah, this. Uh, exactly. <laughs> that exactly. is an essential coming out of this conversation. <laughs> Amazing. Grab it. Um, so, you know, one of the things that we talked a lot about is tapping into culture, tapping into community, driving that disruption. Mm -hmm. um, I'd love to, to hear from you first, Lori. Like, you've stretched into lots of different places as a brand. You created a, a true crime. You've, you know, you've partnered with really interesting brands, pro, you know, provoking brands that maybe aren't necessarily a natural fit for, mm -hmm. for the brand. So talk to us about brand elasticity and how you think about the right partnerships, the right yeah. um, collabs that make sense for the brand, but also help you stretch into new spaces. Yeah. Um, you know, one of the collabs that we just did was actually released last week. Uh, it was a collab that we took about two years in the making on this. So very, I say that because it takes a lot of thought to make sure you're landing something that your community is going to respond to. And that one was actually with Tinder. So, you know, you would say, what does Tinder, uh, you know, the world's leading dating app, have anything to do with Gen Z? Well, you just said it yourself. Elf is the number one Gen Z brand. Actually, we've been number one for five consistent quarters. And part of that rationale is because we're listening and we're leading in. So Tinder, at the heart of Tinder, it's all about human connection. Right, say what you want about it, right? Whether you're coupled or single, say what you want, mm -hmm. but it is about human connection. And one of the things that we leaned into is we realized that people who, yeah, it's great about dating, whether you're dating, you're going for a job interview, at the heart of it, it's about making a first impression. And that first impression is sometimes the hardest. You talked about coming out of COVID, imagine that. And what ELF did was actually lean into how much prep goes into your date night bag. Even if you're going out on date night with your husband, you're thinking, what am I gonna put in my bag? So what goes into your bag? How much prep? What is the person across from me thinking of me? Do I have my best face here? And what we've done is we put a put your best face forward, put your best ELF forward. And it's face the first date. First, face the first date with confidence to be able to do that. And all these were gleaned off of insights that we were serving. I don't know how many of you know this, but red lips actually get more swipes. You have a better chance at love if you wear red lips on your profile. <laughs> at least a connection. A connection. Yeah. How about red fingernails, Chris? Is red that fingernails? also a thing? I think uh, that would work too. <laughs> but when you, or really well, you know, maintained hair with a GHD styler. Above all that, you know, when you actually think about it, you actually put something out there that your community will say, oh, I never saw a mashup between a tech company and a beauty brand, but this actually makes a lot of sense mm -hmm. because what you're doing at the end of it is pushing out self-expression. Yep. That's great. Yep. How about you, Chris? I'll use our, our OPI brand as an example. You know, OPI, OPI stands for Endless Expression with Color. So that filter is what we use when we think through partnerships. And we've done partnerships with uh, everything from Xbox uh, to have multicolored uh, Xbox controllers through, uh, through vans um, and, and movie partnerships. So a number of different things there where vans and nail polish might not seem like the connection. Xbox and nail polish on the surface might not seem like the connection, even though there are a huge number of female, female gamers. Um, but uh, we, use, we use that simple brand statement as the filter of what makes sense for us from a, a partnership's perspective. Mm -hmm. Endless expression of color. Mm -hmm. Amazing. Um, I want to end with a topic that I know you're both very passionate about, which is team building. Mm. You both have built insane brands that have had wild success in the market, and obviously that doesn't help. That doesn't happen without building killer teams. So, can you talk to us about what maybe a, a non-obvious mm. leadership lesson is that you want to impart to other leaders here in the room that you believe has most contributed to your success as a brand? Lori, let's start with you. Um, I know that we, we are at the clock here, so I will say that probably if I had to choose one, it's fail forward. It's, you know, in order to be a company that's been able to have the growth that we've had to the growth trajectory, we need to be able to make mistakes and you've got to be able to learn fast from them not dwell on them, not create task force teams to sit there and evaluate what happened with it. It's take the learning, move on quick. Mm -hmm. And that's how we've been able to, from a steady heartbeat, been able to pulse out probably, if I had to count, over 50 campaigns since the start of January, is we don't stop. You learn and you build that algorithm to get sharper and better at reflecting the needs of your community. Yeah. I would say from a, a people management perspective is provide context. 
Uh, and I say that from a very selfish point of view. That was myself growing up in, in, in corporate America. I always wanted to know why. Mm-hmm. And in, in a lot of cases, there was no time for the why. There was only time for the do. Mm-hmm. Um, and and in, in my management style, I really try to provide context as to why someone, be it a, you know, for a while I had IT reporting to me. Why does somebody in the call center in Warsaw need to answer the phone at a certain rate and provide help at a certain rate? Why does someone in a supply chain, uh, in a distribution center, need to work towards delivery and getting things to a hairdresser maybe a day earlier because that's going to mean the difference between them being able to have 30 clients in a week versus 25 clients yeah. in a week. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think providing context to, uh, to people at all levels of the organization is probably my single greatest leadership lesson. Mm. Final drops of wisdom from Lori and Chris. Let's give it up for the two of them. Thank you, Thank you so much. Thanks, thanks. And now you have to shimmy off stage. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you.